So first off, I'm super grateful that Intel decided to send us two of their brand new CPUs for review. We got the Core Ultra 9 285K and the Core Ultra 5 245K, meaning we're only missing the Core Ultra 7 265K, but I think I might be able to get my hands on that one too, at some point. Unfortunately, while we do have these chips, we don't have a review ready for you all yet because we don't have an LGA 1851 motherboard yet. That's one of the downsides of these new Arrow Lake CPUs. They require new motherboards. The Core Ultra 200 Series Reviewers Kit, or the least one I received, only includes the CPUs, which means to get motherboard, I had to get in touch with either ASUS, ASRock, Gigabyte, or MSI. Now, one of them is sending a motherboard, so that's good. But unfortunately, it shipped out a little late, and it won't get here until the day this video goes up which as I'm filming this is tomorrow. And that's at the earliest. So in lieu of an actual review, uh, we're gonna unbox the reviews kit, take a look at these chips, uh, talk about internal benchmark figures from Intel, and also discuss the LGA 1851 socket. All right, welcome to a new camera angle. Uh, there is basically no room. <laughs> so apologies for if this looks weird, but this this is as good as it's gonna get but anyways let's uh, open this i have of course already opened this box so this is not going to be a brand new thing i'm not going to fake my reaction obviously i had to check to make sure the cpus are okay so let's take a look that is what it looks like as you can see it is made to game and ready for anything we'll see about that in our review but anyways let's uh, open this up and God, I really hope you guys cannot hear the lawn work that's happening right now. If you can, I am so sorry. But anyways, as you can see, we have the uh, 285K here and the, the 245K here. And also, we have this really cool uh, plaque sort of thing. Uh, it's not um, super clean, sorry, and they also scratch it up a bit, but it's really cool. We have this like holographic card here, and then we also have a, uh, a spec sheet. God. I need to like clean this out to make sure that I don't even know if that's scratch. Anyways, whatever. Uh, this uh, spec sheet is a little bit weird personally because they have like the KF models here. And obviously based on the uh, specs that they've listed, uh, clock speed, core count, cache, whatever. Uh, these, these SKUs don't differ in that regard. So I'm not sure why they have the KF models here. This also strongly implies that there's not a 285KF like at all right now, which is really interesting. But it was, yeah, I think this is really cool. Uh, sometimes they include these sorts of things for like uh, review kits, whether it's CPUs or GPUs, but usually that's like for like the big deal stuff. So it's really interesting to uh, get one of these. The 14th gen review kit uh, did not have this kind of like uh, souvenir sort of thing. But anyways, let's open up the uh, 245K. And yes, that is what I do if I uh, flub up <laughs> while I'm trying to say something. There are so many outtakes for pretty much all these videos, uh, except for this because I'm just doing this in one take. It's not even scripted. But anyways, as we can see, uh, I hope that looks good. I actually don't have uh, a preview of what you guys can see. So I hope that's uh, clear enough. Let's put that guy over there. Look at this guy. So this is the same dimensions as an LGA 1700 chip, but the contact pads on the back are obviously different. There's uh, 151 extra uh, pads, obviously, because you know that's 1700 plus uh, 151 equals 1851. So let's uh, let's put this guy back. Do I remember how this guy went in? Did he go in like this? He did. Okay, good. Uh, I have him upside down, I think, uh, but that's fine. Actually, no, that is not how he went in. You know, I might as well fix that. All right, there we go. No, I don't even. I'm going to fix this at some point. <laughs> uh, let's get you out of the way. So what, what we're all waiting for is the 285K. And, oh. Of course, the 285K is not going to look too much different. Um, it... It's the same chip minus uh, the text on it and what's enabled on the bottom. Oh, it looks like they might have tested this chip before it went out, which I guess is not surprising, but, or maybe that's just someone's fingerprint. But anyways, yeah, here it is, the 285K. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just kind of cool seeing it, even though I have not been able to test this, which kills me. I wanted us to have the reviews out on review day. 
Um, but anyways, even even just looking at it, it's it's just a sight to behold, especially when you know what's under here. Like having like that crazy like uh, four tile setup, uh, even even committing more to the triplet design than AMD does uh, in some ways, at least for like the consumer stuff. But yeah, this is just uh, it's it's fascinating that Intel finally got this stuff to work. And uh, you can also see if you look really closely, you can see uh, some of these uh, pads like are populated and some are not. These don't look like they have anything. Like if you see here, it's kind of colored differently. Also these up here, there's some discoloration happening up here and here and here. I don't know if that means anything. I hope that doesn't mean this thing's defective. We have no idea. <laughs> um, if it is, then that uh, really sucks. Also, I just put a bunch of fingerprints on here. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what's in the reviews kit. Sorry, the reviewers kit. Um, some of that, uh, the fact that it's only CPUs might surprise some of you, I think. Uh, it actually surprised me a bit because usually I thought, no, I'm not like a CPU reviewer. I am now, but I really haven't been. For 14th gen, it was just the CPUs. That wasn't that surprising. Uh, but with this, I figured that they, were, they would at least uh, send a motherboard, like some Z890 motherboard. I'm sure like the big people uh, were able to get a motherboard much easier than I was. Uh, not that I'm complaining because Silicon Insights is obviously very small right now that we even got these CPUs at all was a, th that was a big coup, honestly. So tons of thanks to Intel for sending these. Uh, I'm super excited to show this off, uh, especially like, th this plaque, this plaque right here is really cool. Even though like it's a bit scuffed. I mean like to have, at least the holographic card is fine. If I wanted to like laminate it or put it in like a new one of these sort of like uh not not resin but it, it's it's held together by screws. If I wanted to make it nicer, I could. So yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some of uh, Intel's uh, internal benchmarks. Welcome to the Coral Tr9 285K Reviewer's Guide. If you ever want to know what a CPU review guide looks like, this is pretty much it. Review guides for other components are pretty similar too, in case you're wondering. These guides mostly exist to give reviewers a way to check their work and make sure nothing weird is happening. Unfortunately, this review guide just has numbers for the 285K in isolation, which is a bit disappointing, especially since our suite of benchmarks doesn't have a ton of overlap with Intel's. One of the benchmarks I want to focus on is TimeSpy, which we've recently tested on our 14900K. The TimeSpy CPU test is heavily multi-threaded, acting more like Cinebench and Blender rather than a normal gaming test. Intel says the 285K should hit about 20,000 points, but our 14900K was able to score roughly 21,000. We tested our 14900K at the default 253 watt power limit, just as Intel did with the 285K, so this would appear to be a performance regression, and one that Intel seems to be open about. There's also testing data for Cinebench R23, rather than the newer Cinebench 2024. We don't use Cinebench R23 in our test suite, so I'm pulling numbers from Anatech's Ryzen 9000 review, which tested the 1400K using the now standard 253 watt power limit. In the multi-threaded test, the 2A5K is apparently much faster than the 1400K. The Arrow Lake flagship scored about 41,000 points according to Intel, while the 1400K only gets roughly 33,000 points. That puts the 2A5K at a nearly 25% boost in performance compared to the 1400K. In the single threaded test though, the 2A5K only shows a 6% boost in performance, which makes sense since power stops being a limiting factor when just a single core is in use. We also have all of these gaming benchmarks, but our gaming test methodology is completely different, so we can't really compare our numbers to Intel's. These internal tests were done at 1080p with high settings, in case you're wondering. Anyways, that was the review guide for the 2A5K. I hope it was interesting to pierce the veil on some of this reviewer stuff. But now, let's shift gears and talk about the LGA1851 socket. When it comes to the Core Ultra 200 series, the thing at the forefront of my mind is motherboard support. Now that's mostly because of the motherboard conundrum we're in right now, but I do think it's something that regular users will also have to consider. Firstly, anyone who wants one of these new CPUs will also need to pick up a new motherboard. That's obviously a necessity every now and then, since it can be hard to introduce new features on an old socket. For example, if Intel wants to introduce the next generation of uh, memory support, uh, for example, DDR6, then that will probably require a new socket. 
Though Intel has historically struggled to justify introducing a new socket, and unfortunately LGA 1851 is not an exception. Compared to LGA 1700, the outgoing socket, really all you're gaining are more PCIe 5.0 lanes. To be clear, having more lanes is great, but it's not a good selling point on its own. I would have loved to see LGA 1700 get one more generation, especially since 14th gen was such a bust. I also have to bring up AMD's approach with the AM4 and AM5 sockets. Intel has pretty much always moved on from socket after it's made two generations for it, even if the underlying architectures of these chips aren't that different. By contrast, the AM4 socket is compatible with four generations of Ryzen CPUs, and AM5 will probably cap out at three generations, maybe four again if we're lucky. It's just really disappointing that Intel switches sockets so frequently, especially when upgrading from an older motherboard to a newer one doesn't really feel like upgrading. To be clear, the switch from LGA 1700 to LGA 1851 isn't even the worst instance of this. You may recall back in 2017 when Intel introduced its new 8th gen CPUs that they didn't work in LGA 1151 socket motherboards even though they were made for that socket. That was because Intel introduced an LGA 1151 V2 socket. It was the same socket but with very minor changes but Intel mandated that people had to use the new one if they wanted the new chips. This really sucked for people who were on the original LGA 1151 socket because they only had access to 6th and 7th gen CPUs, and they were basically the same, so that basically meant no upgrade path whatsoever. That brings me to the future of the LGA 1851 socket, because it's not clear what Intel is going to do with it. Ever since Intel released the first core branded CPUs, each socket has only ever supported at most two different generations, and that's not including refreshes. So on LGA 1700, 12th gen Alder Lake was the first generation, and 13th and 14th gen Rapture Lake were the second generation. You might think that Air Lake is the first chip for the LGA 1851 socket, but that's not actually true. In actuality, Meteor Lake was always intended to be the debut chip for the LGA 1851 socket, and Intel had planned a desktop version of Meteor Lake, but canceled it at some point. Air Lake isn't even technically the first LGA 1851 chip, because earlier this year, Intel launched Core Ultra PS a socketed version of the mobile Meteor Lake chip. These weren't intended for the desktop though, they're used for pretty much anything else. Since 2011, Intel has always limited sockets to supporting at most two generations of CPUs, and since LGA 1851 is already technically on its second generation, that means that these 800 series motherboards might not even support what comes after Aero Lake. That would effectively make LGA 1851 a single generation socket, even worse than what happened with LGA 1150. Now, there's no reason why Intel couldn't extend the life of LGA 1851 and give it a third generation. If AMD could support both the original Zen architecture and Zen 3 on the same AM4 socket, LGA 1851 could certainly support whatever Arrow Lake successor is. I'm just worried because of Intel's history with sockets. LGA 1151 V2 was an incredibly stupid thing for Intel to do, and it burned up a lot of goodwill with the desktop enthusiast community. Is dropping a socket after what is effectively a single generation within Intel's capabilities? Absolutely. That doesn't mean Intel will do it for sure, but we won't really know. Intel, if you're watching, I know you love swapping out sockets just for the tiniest upgrades, but I think in this case, it's probably a bad idea. People are already unhappy with having to swap out their motherboards after two generations. But after what happened with Rapture Lake and dying CPUs, and also the fact that Arrow Lake is mostly just catching up to AMD and not beating AMD, you guys have lost lots of trust and goodwill with the community. If LGA 1851 ends up being the Core Ultra 200 series socket, that's going to make a lot of people upset. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if some people decide not to upgrade to Air Lake simply because they're worried that this will be a single generation socket. So Intel, if you have any plans to put Air Lake successor on the LGA 1851 socket, say something about it. Make an announcement, a statement, something. That would go a long way to assure people that they're not buying a motherboard that's only going to be good for a single generation. And if all we hear is silence, then I think that answers the question of whether LGA 1851 is a single generation socket. Anyways, that's our Core Ultra 200 series preview. If you like what we do, like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, and click the bell icon so you get notified when our review goes up. If you want to support us financially, we have a Patreon, a link is in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.